Curse of the Blue Figurine by John Belairs, Chapter 6. The next morning after breakfast, Johnny went off to school as usual. At St. Michael's, the school days were always started with Mass in the church at eight. On this particular morning, as Johnny saw the great gloomy brick church looming up before him, he felt a tightening in his gut. There was something he wanted to know, or rather there was something he was afraid of finding out. Up the worn steps and into the church he went. He paused in the vestibule to dip his fingers in the holy water font and make the sign of the cross. Then he pushed open the inner doors and walked down the aisle. The seventh graders always sat in the third and fourth pews back from the font on the left side of the main aisle. When Johnny reached the end of his pew, he genuflected and then started in. Then he stopped. He stared and his blood ran cold. At the far end of the pew sat Eddie Tomke. His right arm was in a cast, and the cast was in a sling. Eddie had broken his arm. Johnny stood dead still. His mouth hung slightly open, and he went on staring. Finally, Eddie noticed him. He turned and scowled. He looked as if he wanted to say something nasty, but you weren't allowed to talk in church. And Sister Electa was sitting in the row behind. Hey, Dixon, somebody whispered, move it. Johnny came to himself with a jolt. He realized that he was blocking the entrance to the pew. He muttered, Excuse me, and sidled on down the pew till he was sitting next to Eddie. Johnny had barely gotten seated when the sanctuary bell tinkled and the priest and the altar boys came out of the little door to the right of the, the altar. The morning mass had begun. Throughout the service, Johnny stood and knelt and said prayers along with everyone else. But his mind was not on his prayers. He was thinking of something else. Yesterday... He had held the blue figurine in his hands, and he had wished that Eddie would break his neck. He hadn't broken his neck, but he had broken his arm. Was it a coincidence? Johnny didn't think so. He felt scared, and he felt terribly guilty. He felt like he was sitting next to the body of somebody he had murdered. He wanted to turn to Eddie and say, I'm sorry, but Eddie would not have understood what he was talking about, and Johnny would have gotten bawled out for talking in church. Mass was over, and the kids filed out of the church two by two, Soon Johnny was seated at his desk in the second-floor classroom. Sister Electa announced that the East Side had won the paper drive. Everybody whooped and cheered. Johnny tried to cheer, but what came out was kind of weak. Yesterday he would have been thrilled, but now a dark fear filled his mind, and he could not get rid of it. Johnny went through the rest of the day mechanically like a robot. He did his arithmetic and religion and history lessons, but his mind was in a fog. Out of the fog, thoughts came floating. He told himself that he was getting upset over nothing. It was just it was all just a coincidence. Eddie's broken arm had nothing to do with him. He hadn't caused the arm to break. How could he? By saying words over an old souvenir? But what if it wasn't a souvenir? What if the stories about Father Bart were true? By the time the school was by the time the school day was over, Johnny was a wreck. He was eaten up with guilt and fear and worry. What could he do? He couldn't tell grandma or grandpa. They wouldn't understand. But he could tell the professor. The professor was a smart man and a wise man. When he heard the whole story, he would know what to do. Johnny was strangely silent during dinner that evening. Grandma and Grandpa were used to his daydreaming during meals, but this was something different. He seemed to be worried, and his face was pale. Twice, Grandpa asked Johnny if anything was wrong, and twice Johnny said no, everything was fine. Finally, after dessert, Johnny cleared his throat and announced that he had a chest date with the professor this evening. This was a lie, of course. The professor didn't even know he was, that he was coming. "'Don't stay out too late,' said Grandma as Johnny got up to go. Grandma was a real bug about sleep. She was convinced that nine-tenths of the things that were wrong with people were caused by lack of sleep. "'I won't,' said Johnny. "'And please put on your sweater,' Grandma added. "'It's cold out there tonight. Remember, it's not summer yet.' "'Uh-huh,' said Johnny. He walked out to the coat tree in the front hall, and took his sweater off the hook. As he put it on, he found that strange images were floating around in his head. In his mind's eye, he saw himself standing before the altar in the church, staring up at the gilded figures. Then he saw himself standing across the street from the church in the winter time. Snow was blowing past, and somebody was standing on the steps of the church waiting for him, but he couldn't tell who it was. Johnny shook his head. The images were gone. With a thoughtful look on his face, he went to the door and opened it and stepped outside. It was a chilly April night. It had rained earlier, and the sidewalks glistened. Johnny walked across the porch and clumped down the steps. He stood for a moment, looking across at the professor's house. 
The lights were on in the study upstairs, but now that he was out here, Johnny realized that he did not have the faintest desire to go talk to his friend. He wanted to go someplace else instead. Suddenly, he swung into motion. He trotted down the sidewalk, turned right, and kept going. A few minutes later, Johnny was standing across the street from St. Michael's Church. He stared up at its massive dark shadow, and he realized that he was actually in the picture that was in his mind a few minutes earlier, only it wasn't winter time, and there was no dark figure waiting for him on the steps. Still, Johnny couldn't take the feeling that he had stepped into a dream. He felt strange, weirdly calm. Quickly, he crossed the street. He mounted the steps and tugged at the iron ring. The door swung open, and he was inside in the dimly lit vestibule. Johnny pushed the inner door open and stepped into the church. At first, he just stood there in the back, in the darkness under the choir loft. He drank in the musty, incensey, waxy smell. Two of the overhead lights were on. They cast a dim yellowish light in the cavernous interior of the church. Up in the sanctuary, Johnny could see the gesturing, staring figures on the altarpiece. In its bracket on the sanctuary wall, the red, light, the red lamp flickered. Rows of empty pews stretched away before Johnny. Empty? Well, no. Not quite. Somebody was sitting in the front pew, just sitting quietly and staring up at the altarpiece. The light was bad, but the person seemed to be a short, gray-haired man in a black overcoat. Johnny felt a sudden chill. He thought about the ghost of Father Bart. Then, in the next instant, Johnny realized that his imagination was running away with him again. He had been thinking all day about Eddie's broken arm and figurine. And the figurine. And it had made him edgy. Lots of old people came to the church to pray, especially in the evening. It was nothing to get all worked up about. Johnny slipped into a pew, knelt down, and made the sign of the cross. He stared up at the golden door of the tabernacle. Johnny wanted to get rid of his guilty feelings. He wanted to get rid of the feeling that he was the one who had broken Eddie's arm. He knew it was silly to think that a souvenir of Cairo, Illinois, was magic, but his guilt wouldn't go away. Now he wanted to say a prayer that would make him feel peaceful and happy again. Silently, his lips just barely moving, Johnny said the act of contrition. Oh, my God. I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because of thy, thy just punishments, but most of all because I have offended thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve, with the help of thy grace, to sin no more and to avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. After he had said this prayer, Johnny knelt, silent, his chin resting on his folded hands. He would have liked to hear the voice of God telling him that everything was okay, but all he heard was the rushing of blood in his ears and the swish of traffic passing outside. He felt better, a little better anyway, and he decided on the spur of the moment he would like to light a candle for his mother. He got up, sidled out of the pew, and walked down the aisle to the vigil light rack near the confessional. He lit a candle and then knelt and said a brief prayer for his mother. He got up, and as he was turning around, he got his first good look at the man who was sitting in the front pew. In a way, it was a relief. This little man did not look in any way like the evil Father Bart. He had a bland, freckled face and a little snub nose. His hair was iron-gray and swept back in wings along the sides of his head. His eyebrows were black and arched, so that he had a permanently surprised look. The man was wearing a pinstriped gray suit, a gray vest, a black overcoat, and a gray tie with a pearl stick pin. His shoes were polished, and everything about him looked spotless and neat and prosperous. As soon as the man saw Johnny was looking at him, he smiled shyly. Well, good evening, young man, he said. What brings you to the church so late at night, eh? Johnny moved closer. When he answered, he whispered. He always whispered in church. I was saying a prayer for my mom, he said. She died a little while ago. Ha! Ah, said the man, he nodded knowingly. That's sad. I am sorry to hear it. And quite unexpectedly, he went on. You know, young man, he said, fixing Johnny with his large, surprised eyes. I am a pretty good judge of character, and I think that you are a young man with a problem. Is that so? Johnny was startled. He didn't know what to say. The man smiled. Ah, it's true, isn't it? I can see it in your face, he patted the seat of the pew. Would you care to sit here and tell me all about it? To his own great surprise, Johnny found himself sitting down next to the little man. And then he told him everything. It all came tumbling out about Johnny's broken arm and the blue figurine and all. To Johnny, talking to the little man seemed as easy, well, as easy as walking across a room. The man was so warm and sympathetic. 
He shook his head and frowned when Johnny told him about the nasty things that he had done to him, and those large dark eyes seemed so wise, so knowing. When Johnny had finished his tale, he sat silent, hands folded in his lap. He wondered what the man would say. At first, the man said nothing. He stared thoughtfully at the floor, then at last he said, "'Well, young fellow,' said the man slowly, "'it seems that you have a problem. Your problem is that you imagine things and you worry too much. The figurine isn't magical, that much seems clear, but—' He added oddly, "'Wouldn't it be fun to pretend that it was?' Johnny was puzzled. "'I, I don't get what you mean.' Just this. You are afraid of this big bully, Eddie. Maybe if you were, pre were to pretend to yourself the blue figurine was magic, you would be able to stand up to him. It might give you some unexpected strength. What do you think of that idea, eh? Johnny was still confused. Would, would you explain that to me again, sir? The man smiled patiently. What I'm suggesting is very simple. I'm merely saying that you should pretend. Use the powers of your imagination. Every morning before you go to school, rub the figurine and say some silly prayer. Make one up. Call upon the gods of Egypt if you want to. You'll find their names in any dictionary, you see. And if you imagine that you're strong, you really will be strong. I think it'll help you. I really do. Johnny frowned and bit his lip. He didn't like this plan. He didn't like it at all. Look, he said slowly, you have to understand, I, I wouldn't want to hurt anybody. I mean, what if the little blue statue really is magic? What if I used it to make somebody have an accident or kill them? I wouldn't. The little man burst into laughter, high-pitched, silvery laughter. Ha 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 ha! My, you do have an imagination, he exclaimed, still laughing. A real grade-A imagination, that is for certain. He laughed a bit more, and then suddenly he grew serious. He fixed Johnny with those uncannily large eyes. Listen, young fellow, he said in a low, sincere voice. I would not for the world have anything bad happen to you. Not for the world! I'm merely suggesting something that you can do to help yourself. People are funny creatures. If they think they're ugly, then they really are ugly. If they think they're weak, then they really are weak. Whatever you think you are, that's what you are. If you use that little blue figurine to convince yourself that you're strong, then maybe you really will become more confident, stronger. At least I think it's worth a try. Give it a try. And if you don't like the way this little game makes you feel, you can quit. How about it, eh? Will you try? Johnny listened and found he was agreeing with the man. The man's voice was low and purring and very persuasive, and his eyes, well, they were hypnotic. They were like great black pools. Maybe it's a good idea, thought Johnny. Maybe it would work. I, I guess I'd like to try it, said Johnny hesitantly. The man smiled broadly. Good, he exclaimed enthusiastically. Try it and let me know how it works. I come in here often just to sit and think and pray. Stop, uh, stop in, oh, let's say in a week's time and let me know how you're getting on. Good luck, by the way. Johnny shook hands with the man and thanked him for listening to his problems. He started to get up, but the man reached out and laid his hand on his knee to stop him. Just a second, he said, smiling. I have something for you. He reached into his vest pocket and took out a ring. It's just a silly trinket, but it might help you with the little game you're going to play. Here, hold out your hand. Johnny held out his hand, and the man laid the ring in it. Curious, Johnny looked down at what he was holding. It was a rather odd ring. It looked like it was made from a bent nail at the place where the two ends of the nail met. They held a small, transparent stone that was tinted yellow. There was something under the stone. It looked like tiny slivers of wood arranged to form the letter B. It's a monogram ring, said the man, tapping the stone with his forefinger. My name is Beard, Robert Beard. The ring has been passed down through several generations of my family. It's worthless except for its sentimental value. I thought you might like to have it. And there we will pause.